Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about surgical nutrition. You have a patient who is known um, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, had blocked neck dissection. Comment on the following x-ray. You'll be presented by a chest x-ray and as you can see here, there is a um, radio-opaque substance, a radio-opaque tube coming in the midline, bisecting the carina, crossing the diaphragm by more than 10 centimeters and you can see the location of it is currently inside the stomach. So this is an adequate view of a chest x-ray of this patient showing an NG tube in the midline, crossing the carina, crossing the diaphragm, and it's more than 10 centimeters beyond the diaphragm. So this is a good location of the NG tube. All right, so this is how you should comment in the exam on this x-ray. How do you confirm the NG tube is placed normally or correctly placed. So the first line that we do is we take an aspirate and measure the pH and uh, it should be consistent with the pH of the stomach which will be asked later on. The second part that we can do if we fail to do that or if we fail to get an aspirate we can get a chest x-ray to uh, basically look where exactly is the NG tube. There are multiple methods that we should not use in the NHS to identify the correct location of the NG tube. And this includes, do not use your stethoscope, do not look for the gastric bubble, bubbles or the bubbles at the end of the tube, um, do not test the, the acidity or the alkalinity of the aspirate using a litmus paper because this is not accurate, and also observing the patient of the NG tube aspirate or the appearance of the NG tube aspirate. We do not do that, so we avoid auscultation will avoid litmus paper will avoid uh, looking at the bubbling or any kind of observation you have to get an objective measure and this includes the pH of the aspirate and um, also the radiograph what are the indications for oral nutrition support post-operatively so here the question is asking specifically about oral support when are you going to give oral support for your patients so think about malnourished patients or the patient is acutely unwell but is still having um, a consciousness and is able to cooperate with you and is able to basically swallow. So the indications can include multiple things or basically four indications. If the patient had inadequate oral intake for five days or if they have been in prolonged recovery from a major illness or unintentional weight loss or those who have been on alcohol as well. What is internutrition? So we're going to ask two questions about internutrition. This is basically the nutrition when you use the natural um, spaces or the oral feeding, basically. So internutrition has some advantages and has different routes of administration. So the routes of administration is basically oral, but we can talk about oral gastric tube or nasogastric tube or nasogestional tube or pig insertion or pig insertion percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy or uh, 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 percutaneous endoscopic jejunostomy or jejunostomy in general. So nasogastric, orogastric, a pig insertion or via the small bowel could be a nasogestional or a feeding jejunostomy. The advantages of internutrition, so this kind of nutrients are more physiological and therefore you have less complications from the, um, uh, the feed itself. So it's more physiological it's relatively cheaper than parental nutrition. You've got fewer complications, specifically the biochemical abnormalities, and you can tailor the feed for the patient requirements. And most importantly, you can basically use the calories more efficiently uh, when they enter the circulation via the portal system. And also, there are three very important complications as well. It prevents the bacterial transition across the bowel wall, basically preserves your flora. There is reduction in incidence of a stress-induced hemorrhage and there is no requirement for central venous insertion. I know it might sound a little bit much to remember all of this, but try to think about it. What is good about this enteral feeding, you're using a natural space, you're using the usual food, but usually it's smashed, so it's more physiological. All right, it's more physiological, and this will make less complications, specifically biochemical abnormality. You can tailor the feeding requirement according to your patient. The calories are being used more efficiently, and it prevents some serious complications, such as getting rid of your flora or bacterial transition across the wall or stress-induced hemorrhage as well. 
You should monitor a few things on a daily basis for patients who are currently in any kind of nutrition. You should monitor their body weight, and we're going to mention how to monitor that. And you should monitor the tube that's that was inserted, and also you should monitor the electrolytes. Body weight, you can measure the BMI or the body weight on a daily basis, and also daily abnormal girth for ascites, and also you can measure, you can measure the med, cir med arm circumference and the triceps full thickness as well. The line, you're basically worried if it's an oral line, you're worried about obstruction or kinking or migration or malposition of this tube. If it's an IV line, such as PEC line or um, a central line, you're more worried about something like um, a basically a line thrombus or a line associated thrombosis. Fluid and electrolytes, you want to measure the patient's electrolyte, not necessarily on a daily basis, but to measure the sodium, the potassium, the magnesium, the phosphate. You sh also should be worried about refeeding syndrome and thinking about it, which we're going to talk about it later on and the glucose tolerance, and also keep a fluid chart for this patient to measure how much fluid they had over the last 24 hours, etc. cetera. Um, why nasogenal feed is preferred over nasogastric feed? This is extremely important. So if you bypass, so nasogenal from the name, it goes into the jejunum. So you bypass the gastric phase, and you're sort of causing some protective measures for the body. And this includes, so it's post-pyloric and feed, and this beyond the pyloric sphincter, sphincter into the jejunum and is preferred over the nasogastric tube because this will give your stomach some rest and it avoid the gastric phase and therefore it doesn't stimulate your pancreas and the feed is directly delivered into the intestine thus it's maintaining the mucosal integrity of your stomach and how would you know if the patient is absorbing nutrients well after inserting the tube there are multiple measures that you can do this basically starts by you start your feed on 30 milligram per hour 30 milliliter per hour and then after four hours you start to measure the aspirate if it's less than 250 ml you start increasing your feeding uh, to 65 milliliter per hour and um, and then you keep following measuring the aspirate of every uh, four hours and if it's if it stays less than 250 you're safe if it's more than 250 milliliter you can think about managing this patient differently by giving them something like prokinetic the prokinetic drug these are drugs that enhances the contractility of the stomach and this can include the metoclopramide the erythromycin and also the domperidone and these are the doses of these medications what is the normal pH of the stomach it's a from 1 to 1 1.5 to um, to 5 or 1 to 5.5 what is the normal pH of the stomach it's from 1 to 5.5 when is the pH of the stomach is not reliable indicator for the position of the NG tube if you have a patient who's acutely unwell uh, or uh, basically in a continuous catabolic state you need to avoid measuring the pH or the patient is being treated from an anti from an uh, acid reflux or being currently on anti reflux medication what is refeeding syndrome refeeding syndrome is a syndrome is basically some sort of symptoms um, and also refeeding you're thinking about um, resuscitating your patient or giving them the nutrients after a prolonged time of starvation so basically refeeding syndrome is divided as constellation of symptoms or a group of symptoms right of metabolic and electrolyte abnormality due to potentially fetal shift of fluid and electrolyte causing imbalance in these flows and electrolyte it happens in particular in uh, patients who are currently being resuscitation resuscitated by an any sort of nutrition, whether an enteral or parental nutrition, specifically a malnourished patient who are having high catabolic state or who are in prolonged phase of surgical trauma, any kind of surgery as well. The changes are the hallmark is hypophosphatemia. You can also get hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, and any abnormality in the glucose metabolism and the vitamin deficiency and also abnormality in the fluid imbalance. So to go back and summarize what we mentioned today, we talked about the x-ray. You need to find the energy tube in the midline, crossing the carina, crossing the diaphragm, and it stays in the stomach. And you confirm by measuring the pH and doing an x-ray. You don't do auscultation. You don't do any kind of observation. The indication for the treatment, you usually think about patients who are currently malnourished or who had recent surgery and you want to give a rest to the stomach. Five days of malnourishment or starvation 
or prolonged recovery from major illness, unintentional weight loss, and patients who are currently in alcohol. Enter nutrition. It is cheap. It is physiological, less complication, less biochemical abnormalities, no stress-induced hemorrhage, and prevent the bacterial transition as well. And there is no requirement for a central venous line or a PIC line. Uh, we should monitor regularly the patient weight, measuring the BMI or uh, the arm circumference or the abdominal girth. Um, measure the line complication as well. You're looking for a thrombus or a kinking, malposition, etc. Fluid and electrolyte, you can get your patient fluid and electrolyte on a daily basis or glucose tolerance, etc. Nasogenal feed is preferred. You give your stomach a rest. You avoid stimulating your pancreas and also you avoid the gastric phase and the feed is directly coming into the stomach so you maintain the integrity of your mucosa. How would you know the patient is absorbing nutrient very well? You measure the aspirate and it needs to be less than 250 uh, after four hours. Um, the drugs you can use, you can use metoclopramide, erythromycin, and domberidone. The normal pH 1 to 5.5, and pH of the stomach is not a reliable indicator in acutely unwell patient or patient on prolonged gastric injury. Refeeding syndrome is a collection or constellation of symptoms that happens in patients who are currently being resuscitated uh, by nutrients, whether it's enter or parenteral, and it leads to disastrous or fatal shift of the fluid and the electrolyte causing imbalance due to aggressive resuscitation. Hypophosphatemia is your hallmark, and that's it for surgical nutrition. Thank you.